Yeah, I'm very good. I'm very good. I use how quickly this has all gone. It seems like only yesterday that we were kicking off GlueCon <laughs> yeah. and uh, you were delivering a fun workshop early on in the program. And now here you are uh, bringing things to a close for us. Well, not a total close because I should remind everybody that right after Luca's presentation, we'll be opening up the lounge and come and join us for a toast to the success of ClueCon. Do come in and say hi. All the right people will be hanging out there and you can ask any final questions that you might have. Of course, um, although ClueCon is an amazing place to ask questions, we do have a community Slack channel that you can go to as well for uh, both SignalWire and FreeSwitch on the community side of the SignalWire Slack. Um, and so there's lots of opportunities. Um, but we are on the last workshop of our two-day program. It's been an exciting ride, and who better to bring it in for a safe landing uh, than lovely Luca. Um, Luca, what are you going to be to us about? So we're going to be going uh, looking at FreeSwitch, as in how to do an installation, how the configuration works, and how to set up a few things in particular, including the dial plan, how to register a phone, and how to set up mod signal wire to easily get a trunk into your instance. It's going to be a condensed version of the usual workshop because you know it's online. Uh, the online format is more suited to shorter material, but I'll try to touch all the important parts, and I'll be always ha happy to answer questions. That's great. These kind of sessions are always very useful because, of course, when people come into a project, quite often they get going with it by watching the odd video or by Googling around a little bit. And sometimes there's just the odd little hole in the knowledge that a session like this can fill in. So very well worth watching. Uh, and of course, if you're new and you, you've got lots to learn, then perfect for you as well. So I'll hand over to you, Luca, and I'll be back at the other end to say thank you and uh, um, moderate any questions and also, of course, um, I think Abby's going to be back uh, when we get to the lounge as well. So take it away, Luca. Thank you very much. Thank you. So here's the let's set up the screen share first. Uh, I'll do it myself. Or Oh, perfect. OK, thank you. Perfect. So uh, what we'll be looking at today is, uh, again, a few um, important points about FreeSwitch, plus some more information that I'd like to um, show you. Uh, the uh, idea here is, go, is to go through a few main use cases, and the slides have more information, which won't fit in the format of one hour, but you can also refer to the slides. Speaking of which, I have put the slides up right now on that URL uh, so you can uh, follow along uh, right away it's uh, usually easier than just to and you don't have to worry about notes etc because it's all in the it's all in the, uh, the slides same goes for the docker container that i'm using for the uh, lab which is what we're also i i have already running on my virtual machine and we'll take a look at so what are we going to go through today first of all an overview of frizzwitch uh we'll look at different ways to do an installation uh Installation will be Docker-based, but really Docker is just a sequence of commands, so we can just look at the code. Configuration structure, particularly directory, which is the users that you register to the server. How a dial plan works, that is how you handle a call. Looking at the main modules that you usually use in a FreeSwitch application. And then install mod signal wire, which is a quick connector that allows you to easily have a sub trunk coming in and out of your server to get connectivity to your signal wire in a matter of minutes. So let's get started. So first, which overview. Again, I think people attending this particular conference are, are a mixed group of people from all walks of life. So there's a lot of people who know what FreeSwitch is, but there's also a few who maybe are hearing from FreeSwitch for the first time. So FreeSwitch is a uh, open source uh, telephone platform, is termed carrier grade, and it, it's uh, technically is a back 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 to back user agent, uh, which also includes a, a very good WebRTC implementation. It's uh, very modular and allows you to include the functionality you need or let, leave out the functionality you don't need and even create custom modules. Uh, it supports a lot of uh, languages, protocols, and formats. And more importantly, it's open source. It was founded by around 15 years ago by Anthony Minasali and the rest of the team, which uh, uh, which did found SignalWire too. And SignalWire has taken up stewardship of uh, FreeSwitch in the best way possible as the open source commits have improved. We've done more releases. We have people committed uh, to the project and we have people at the company work only on the open source side of FreeSwitch. So uh, from that standpoint, there's been many questions during the conference asking me and other people, what is the future of FreeSwitch looking like? It's looking great. We've actually been able to do more work because of uh, SignalWire's sponsor 
sponsoring the project and following up on uh, bug reports and adding features. So uh, be sure that FreeSearch is going to be here for a long time. Also, uh, do use FreeSearch internally, so <laughs> we still have to maintain it anyway. So there's uh, there's that too, which is sounds funny, but so what can I do with FreeSearch? Uh, people are used to looking at FreeSearch as a PBX, which is actually the last use case it listed. PBX will be an office system. So you have extensions, you have registered phones, and you have people dialing into your phones and just talking to uh, to others. But you can do many, many other p things. You can do uh, rating and routing servers, so uh, shifting calls around according to uh, least cost or uh, uh, various rules. Using it just for transcoding, FreeSwitch is a very powerful transcoding engine. It allows you to literally transcode almost anything into almost anything. If some signal, audio or video, can be turned into some other signal, FreeSwitch can do it. You can use it for IVRs and announcements. Uh, we have a lot of people using this to dial out and play announcements. These days, it's pretty common to have that use case because of you know change uh, requirements, etc. So there's a lot more uh, um, warnings and messages being sent out. Of course, if you have power, otherwise in Texas, you're going to be out of luck right now. Conferencing server, so Signal uh, so FreeSwitch as a very powerful conferencing engine, both audio and video. It allows you to do large rooms uh, with little CPU and it's got a lot of controls. Uh, kick people, ban people, mute, move them to differences, etc. You can do voicemail, which is the usual stuff. Uh, there is many people using FreeSwitch as an SPC for other FreeSwitch instances. So you can place FreeSwitch outside of a group of app FreeSwitch servers running as application servers and use those the tier of, of FreeSwitch instances as your session border controller. So controlling who can go in and who can't, for, uh, giving registrations out and that kind of thing. Of course, you can do Dottie and all the hardware-related stuff. There's a lot of support for many different hardware. and uh, devices and then you have a fax server people apparently still use faxing i'm i'm from europe as you can tell from my accent and uh faxing in europe is much less prevalent than it is in the u.s so uh, working with signal wire i've noticed that in the u.s is still very much alive so if you need to send and receive servers for which can do that very well it supports 338 and a variety of other protocols and applications lastly but not least you can build a pbx out of it which is the simplest in a, in a session. Yeah, fax is live in Germany. I think it really depends on whether the country has adopted alternative uh, mechanisms to send certified communications, which is weird because fax is not certified at all. But uh, for example, in the US, the healthcare industry does a lot of faxing because it's the only accepted method to transfer certain types of documents. Great. So, how do I install FreeSwitch? Uh, you can do packages and source. Uh, Debian is the recommended OS for installation. It's the official OS. We support a few others, uh, CentOS and uh, Ubuntu mainly, but those need to be installed from source. Uh, packages are available for the latest release of uh, FreeSwitch in the Debian repository, or you can build it from the source. We have a demo Docker setup uh, that I'm using for uh, this evening's presentation at uh, that URL. Uh, so. And that's where we'll start looking at actual code. So uh, I'd like to interject a little bit of uh, looking at code and the slides so we don't get you know bored. And it's uh... here we are. So let's first take a look at the I prepare two Docker files. The one that we'll be seeing running here in my terminal is actually a terminal bigger one. That... So this is a running Chrisvich right here. And this is going to be in, uh, uh, this uses the package version. Oh, the screen is very slow today. Oh, why it's taking so long to update. Hmm. Okay, we're back. Sorry. Okay, good. So uh, this is the pa install from package. As you can see, so uh, for people who are not familiar with Docker, Docker is a container building system uh, that uh, allows you to build repeatable containers that have an application or, or a server in, in them. Uh, what this boils down to is there's a lot of tooling around it, but really a Docker file itself, which defines how a server, a container is actually built, is just a set of shell scripts. So you can really 
just really true for the most part. Or if it's not a true shell command, it's easy to understand. So, uh, of course, the installation always starts by setting a user and group for your Frizzwitch. This is something I really, really recommend doing, especially for the package installation. Run Frizzwitch as a uh, as a user. It's uh, much, uh, much safer. Uh, Docker in particular mm, doesn't require, but it's recommended to set your GIDs and UIDs precisely so you know what they are so the system doesn't accidentally override them that's something peculiar to docker to i know some other people not using docker still do it for you know stability well we're installing a few other things the locale etc so we don't care about it mm. my comment my comment about installing 1.10 differently because the repository changed in the meantime but really what you do here is you will add the a few not very many requirements then add a a Keyring, and then add the package uh, repositories to Debian. So we first, which uh, has its own packages repositories uh, that hold the current version. That point, yeah. So there's many things you can do. I'm just installing Meta all, and I also have DNS utils on. Um, on a machine because it's, it's tooling that I use to debug. So Frizzwitch Meta all is a huge package. The Frizzwitch is broken down in about 50 smaller packages and you can go mix and match. But I always recommend people starting out with installing everything. And then if you, well, after a while, after you've gotten, gotten acquainted with Frizzwitch and what you need and you don't, maybe you can make your own list of packages. Of course, we clean up so it's uh, the image is, li is lighter, and then we expose a few ports. These are, in general, the ports you need to run Frizzwitch. You'll notice the 6050 port, which is not very stock. 6050 is actually the port that Mod SignalWire uses by default to communicate with SignalWire. That's why I'm opening that, too. Then we're copying over a few limits things and an entry point. So let's go take a look at what limits look like and the entry point looks like, but first, Quick thing, uh, we're setting the shell. So we're telling the container to use bash as the shell. Uh, sorry, the Docker file is stored here. So I put another link in the chat just in case. And the other thing I wanted to take a look at is, as you can see here, we have a health check. The health check is uh, effectively running this command. So fsCLI x status uh, wrapping. Uh, so what we get here is we run fsCLI dash x status, which is something we can go do right now and grab for the up word. If the up word is there, it means the uh, Frizzwitch server is actually up. fsCLI dash x runs a single command that you could run on the CLI. So let me go grab my dash here, and I'll do this. A CLI, as you can see, we're getting a few those low. So I might have something to do with the switching, with the screen switching. Let's see if we can do this some other way. Dot. Hmm. So let's try and grab the terminal from the other window here. There we go. Okay. So this will this this should show. Or. Oh, this is very interesting. So the terminal is apparently not showing. Hmm. Let me do something different. Screen window share. Oh wow, this is new. Oh well, okay, it's back. All right, so we'll I'll, I'll just change here. Sorry for that. I don't, don't really know what's, what the problem is here. So the uh, going back to what we were doing earlier, we ran a, um, a, a, a script. So just a command that is fscli dash x status, and that returns a lot of things. It tells you how long the server has been up, the version, etc. We're looking for the up uh, word, which is somewhere in here. It's right. 
if it starts with up, which is here, as you see right on the on the first line, it means the server is actually running. Yeah, there will be a recorded session available. So don't worry about that. So we'll go back to the slides now, or rather to the code. What I'll just do this so it's actually easier to work with. Okay, good. So this should keep everything on the screen. And that's what the uh, sort the source is, the uh, package install is literally just installing from the from the package. If we go to the uh, source install, it's a little bit more involved, but not by much really. So we still create the same group. We create uh, we install the locales. We install a couple prerequisites. And then we just install the build dependencies here. So you still need the repo to pull in the dependencies. Uh, VM, so this is a Debian uh, container. They're all Debian. And the machine is running on DigitalOcean. Then we'll go and clone Freswitch. Go to the directory. Uh, copy the build uh, modules um, configuration and just run it. Good. So uh, we'll know what a model is in a while. Uh, after that, we'll just link the virus executables and uh, get it running. Keep in mind, this is Docker. So I'm not actually installing system scripts. Uh, those are managed by Docker itself. So Docker in the entry point will just trigger the startup. Startup, which is really just this. Take a look real quick how it looks like. Okay, so we we'll, we we'll start the uh, we we'll start the um, server if the certificate is present. This is used for um, WebRTC. You need certificates for WebRTC to work. Otherwise, we're just starting with no NAT CRP, which is the classic uh, way to start Frizz, which If you know you have no NAT involved, which is actually different than when you have, don't use no NAT if you don't if you are running on AWS because that won't work. We won't go into the networking stuff here because it's actually very complicated. But the, it's uh, if you're running on uh, Amazon, there's a few caveats you need to know, and I'll be happy to help with that. Okay, so once we have a base install, we'll need to look at the configuration. First, which actually has quite a big configuration system. There's a lot in there. So this allows us to keep going. Um, so how is it structured? There is a configuration folder that's if it's a package install, it will look like etc for switch. If it's a configure, if it's a um, uh, source install, it will be in whatever path you specify the prefix, which is with defaults to user local for switch conf. Uh, still, so there is a main file which is for switch .xml, which you actually don't touch very much because it's generated by the others, and the main touch points are. The, so as you see, the configuration is divided in a few different blocks. One is the language files, which is generally where you put your IVR stuff, shows your messages. The directory, which is where your users reside. The dial plan, which is where your people, uh, we, um, which is where your um, calls will be managed. So where a call goes, it goes to a dial plan where it's decided what to do. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Is recommended to run Frizzwitch in Docker in production? Uh, we run doc we run Frizzwitch in Docker in production. We've done it for a long time. Never had any particular problem, aside from the fact that you need to run with NAT host uh, or the mapping the ports is low. But other than that, it's just great. The uh, Then you have the autoload configs. Autoload config folder is a little bit of a mixed bag because everything sits in there, uh, including configuration for all of the modules and especially the SIP configuration, which resides in the SIP profiles. So we'll first take a look at a few examples and then we'll go look at the live machine and see how it's set up. First important configuration file is VARS. So uh, the important thing about vars.xml is that uh, it uh, sits in the root of the system and it allows you to pre-configure pre some stuff 
and the application or uh, server you're building. For example, we'll be using the pre-process uh, command to actually uh, set a default password that's different than the one, two, three, four. We can take a look in just a second. That's really the only change I made uh, compared to the vanilla configuration. And after that, you can use any variable in any place in the rest of the configuration using that syntax, which is double dollar and braces. So we'll look at that in just a second. But first, I want to show you something. Uh, you can also set variables from either environment variables or the output of a command. For example, I'm, I will be using, and I'll show you that, I'm using the envsat command to set the default password from an environment variable. Why that's so? That, that's the way so you can avoid committing credentials to your uh, repository. Keep in mind Docker, but in general, anywhere you're defining a configuration, you might want to define a uh, secrets. You want to keep secrets away from the actual source, so it's better to have them stored in environment variables. The other thing you can do is use exact set to set a variable from a command. The example I have on screen is not really super great, but for example, on we're running on AWS, you will use, as, you, as uh, AWS users know, there's a set of uh, common line commands you can run to know what your IP address is for the machine from outside, because there is no way to know it from inside the machine. So what you do is uh, for you ping whatever service that Amazon provides and set the IP for the machine through that service on startup. These are evaluated on startup. Uh, then we'll see. Uh, let's go. Let's go look at the password uh, at the password sample first. So I'll go into. So my configuration sits here in uh, etc. For switch, and I'll vim vars dot xml. Well, vim is not installed. Sorry. So cat vars dot xml. And so this is a very long file. So there's there's a lot in here. Uh, because there's a lot of comments. The um, password stuff is right at the start. So you know what we'll do instead? Let's do this. Uh, vim conf. I'll pull it up on from the actual edit from the actual folder, not from inside the VM. Okay, this is much easier. As you can see right here at the top of the file. I have exactly, I have an EMV set, setting the password to a, an environment variable. So I can pass that in through an environment variable. In Docker, this will be done by doing this. Uh, in Docker, this will be done by setting an environment file in the Docker Compose setup, or the various ways you have in Docker to pass uh, an environment variable. And then after that, what you do is, you just refer, so I'll, I'll show you what this in my ENV is just a password, so it doesn't really matter. The ENV file just has a single line in it that is Frisbee password, click on TGI 2021. So that is set. that's re literally it. It's a, a simple way to pass variables to your Fizzwitch servers. Of course, a production system and an app, uh, especially if it's built an application server, will have far more configuration involved, right? So there will be more variables. But this is a very simple way. And actually, it's my favorite way to configure Fizzwitch. So if you ever end up having to configure Fizzwitch, this is probably the best way. What else? So first, which XML uh, is effectively the file that includes all of the others. So it's the top of the configuration. That's why I was saying you generally don't touch it because it's just including a lot of other stuff using the various includes. You could go and put your configuration entirely in Fresh.xml, and we've seen people do that for very, very minimal uh, configurations. But in general, you want to do includes because, of, of course, otherwise it gets very hard to read. Uh, all of this is just effectively a big document that you include in Fresh. So Fresh XML could be the, your entire configuration. Breaking it up is just a convention. And following convention, of course, makes it easier for people to help you and to find out things. But it's by no means the only way to do it. OK, so setting up the default passwords, we just check that. So make sure when you're doing an installation, make sure you Go change the password because that's uh, 
first which will tell you and will complain on startup but ultimately you will have an install action that has one two three four as the default password for users especially if you're doing a vanilla install that is just installing the packages to play around make sure you change that password other than that it's easy as you can see here we set the password in the pro process and then we reference it into the in the directory as we saw earlier Oh, so this is important. This gets a lot of people. So if by some reason you want to comment out a pre-processed directive in virus.xml or anywhere you're running those, make sure you don't use an XML or HTML style command because it doesn't work. So the, the XML parser only looks for the strings X pre-process or X no pre-process and processes those anyways. So if you want to remove a statement, you either remove the line, which of course will always work, or you have to add X no pre-process or the uh, statement will always be processed. I like keeping this slide into any presentation about first which because it this gets a lot of people, myself included. I will say that once a week, I end up commanding out something and then re remember you cannot do that. So make sure you, make, uh, you keep the, uh, this in mind. This is a very useful tip. Global variables, uh, so you can set variables through the uh, common line um, interface, which, by the way, is just FS CLA, CLI. So what you can do here as uh, for people who haven't used it, I, I assume, but I shouldn't. This is what uh, we're already in it. Yeah, so FS CLI. There we go. SLI is the common line interface to Frisbee. What you're going to see here in just a second is probably a lot of SIP traffic from scanners, etc., unless I turn off the debug. But otherwise, you can do a lot of things. Like I can do Sophia status, which we'll revisit in a, in a bit, which will show me all the SIP profiles that are on the... Um... Oh, wow, there we go. I don't know for a second, but... I think it's better to set log level zero. Okay, cool. So there we go. What else? Mm, okay, so we bef so before we get started with the user directory, uh, as you can see, in general, it's just all XML. So let's go look at a few uh, files in particular that are useful for us. The first thing to do here is to get a phone register to the system. So first of all, I want to simply show you how I am actually registering a phone here, which is I'm using Bria. Unfortunately, there is no easy way to zoom in to Bria. So I think it's terrible. Yeah, we'll need to find a way to fix this. Okay, cool. So stays like that for now. This will work for sure. Okay, so sorry for that again. Preferences and what I have here, I have just have an account. Uh, again, it's, unfortunately, it's not easy to zoom in, so I'll go slow, so maybe it stays a bit more readable. I've set up a user with a username of 1001, and this is the IP of the current server, and that's the password that I entered earlier, and it's just registered, nothing else. If you have a vanilla setup, once you change the password, you can just have uh, phones registered to this, so there's no really nothing to do. It will just work. Look at the actual configuration here. Mm, so let's see. Again, we are in. Let's let's move to the configuration folder. I'm sure why I have to move the window, or it doesn't update. But at least you can see it now. There we go. So this is the uh, entire configuration folder. There's a lot in here. We'll see. We'll look at some of those. The most important part is lies here in the directory right now. So directory is the user setup. Let's see what's in here. We have a default folder and a default um, configuration file. Look at 
simple configuration file, as you can see, does doesn't really have too much that's important in here. The most important part is defining a domain, which we'll look at in just a bit. And then the important part actually dies here. All of the users are defined in the, the, this folder. Uh, and as you can see, there's a few users you can get started with. Uh, there's there will certainly be like, do I have to add a file every time I want to add a user? You can have multiple users in one file. But uh, the other way, if you have a very dynamic and changing list of users, is to use a module, which we'll see in just a bit, such as uh, mod XML curl. So you can serve your directory directly from a uh, web server. For now, though, let's focus on the main uh, on the main stuff, which will be the user directory. Okay, cool. So all users must be part of a domain. A domain can be an IP or a domain name. They can be part of a group. A group is just a logical grouping you can use then to dial them in from the dial plan, etc. Uh, we are, keep in mind, all files can include other files. So in the case of directory default.xml, we can see that it first defines some stuff, including the domain name, which is the most important part. And then it just uh, includes the default XML, uh, the default the files that are in default.xml. Uh, so you can include from other files. Uh, usually, you don't want to go too deep, but a couple levels are fine. The user definitions are pretty straightforward. So as you can see, we're uh, setting a few variables in case we need them. Uh, overriding variables means those variables will be available in the dial plan when not one of those users is calling in. So you can overwrite uh, values. Generally speaking, you can do this to do testing or debugging because it's usually not super necessary, but it really depends on use case. Since first switch can be done, used for do to do so, so many things, there's always a way to do something. Uh, I want to look at one user, which is in here. So let's look at the beyond the leaf. Okay, but well, that didn't happen. Let's look at the file that I use to connect right now. So 1001.xml. This is very readable and short. As you can see here, we're defining everything about the user. We're defining their ID, which is what they use to log in with, uh, the password, which is, you recall, picked up from the configuration earlier and a uh, voicemail password, which is used in the, the stock dial plan. Well, we're allowing them to call domestic, international, local. All of these variables are mostly used in the dial plan after. So uh, their account code, uh, which context they use, a context which we'll look at when we'll see dial plans, uh, their caller ID name and number. This is where, I don't know, Luca will go. Uh, or their outbound caller ID and color, color, uh, outbound caller ID numbers. So you can do different usernames and uh, so does the DNS name for the domain have to be resolvable from public internet? Well, yeah, if you're planning on having your phones register, it doesn't have to be uh, resolvable from public internet, but it does have to be resolvable by the phones. You can also use an IP address. So the domain name refers to a SIP domain, not to a DNS domain. So you can, you can use a SIP address. In fact, my domain here is a SIP address, the SIP address of the server. Generally speaking, though, of course, if you're using a domain name, it will have to be resolvable, at least from where your phones are trying to connect, which is not necessarily the public internet. OK, so the this is just setting variables. Variables don't do anything by themselves, but we'll use them in the, uh, in the dial plan later. Let's go forward from here. Mm. Wondering if there's a way to avoid having to go in and out of the slides, but probably not. So cool. So once I have configured my users, I now need to get them a way to connect because setting up a user by itself doesn't guarantee the user can connect. The only way you can get a user to connect is to. Holy moly, this is. The only way you can get the user to connect is actually get them a um, is actually to get them a uh, set profile to use, right? 
okay, let's decide to collaborate. First switch under the hood. So as you know, in the open source world, there's a few uh, SEP stacks. There's PJ SEP, there's Sophia, and there's other couple minor implementations. Uh, First switch picked Sophia as the SIP stack, which allows us to do very flexible and very um, standards compliant stuff without any particular effort. What we generally do is, uh, so every profile, so Sophia has a concept of profiles. Every profile is uh, composed of exactly one IP address and one port. So if you want to do multiple profiles, you'll do multiple IP addresses and multiple ports. Of course, every profile has to be on its own port because it's uh, only one port can be listening on a pro on a process on a on one process can be listening on a port. And effectively, if these are separate processes ran by Sophia in Frisbee service. And uh, but you can bind them to the same IP or you can bind them to different IPs in case you have more than one. Generally speaking, you want to bind them to your public IPs with obvious exceptions in case you do need to do something different. Uh, the important part here is that you cannot do a zero 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 bind, so you cannot bind to all interfaces. Any profile needs to be bound to one single IP address. Uh, each profile needs its own port. And of course, uh, the vanilla configs config have two primary profiles. One is the internal stuff for the registered users, and the other is the external profile used to call to dial out. Uh, again, every profile needs its own port. This is something that this is another this thing that's deceptively simple. Some people do get caught up in this and effectively, you know, spend time having to figure that out. Uh, it's important that every profile has its own. Has its own uh, port we can see that in action here if we go back to the fs cli for the server which is probably gonna uh, is not updated again which is so weird yawn silly well we'll make do okay so we finally got it going I'm in the console here, and I'll do Sophia status. I'll take a look at the various profiles. As you can see here, we have a bunch of profiles. We have a... Um... So by the way, the, the purple stuff on top is someone trying to crash the server or trying to get into the server. Uh, of course, this is just a sub server that's just out there on the internet, which is not something you should do in production, but it's it helps because it's easy to set up. So let's go through the various profiles real quick. We have IPv6 profiles, which I'll skip. But as you can see here, we have the, a signal wire profile, which is already registered, which is on port 6050. And it's the one that signal, mod signal wire created. And we'll take a look at that in just a minute. Uh, we have the external profile that's listening on port 5080. And we have the internal profile that's listening on uh, port 5060. So these are all different profiles listening on different ports. Again, you need one port per profile. So you can do the complicated the complex stuff, so just have public calls come in from one way and have the private stuff stay on the other side. There's a lot here. I'll skip through a few things. The most important things are if you, you need to set the external RTP IP and the external SIP IP properly. So you generally use a um, stun or a domain name or even an IP. Especially stun is very commonly used because it will return the correct IP they see from the other side, and that helps with net traversal, especially on Amazon. But make sure those IPs are set correctly. They most are automatically guessed correctly, but it's not always the case. A mm, few things to, mm, if you want to send SIP options, that's probably the most important thing you want to know, and how to set the interval for those options requests, or not do it if you don't want to. Just set all reg options paying to false. You will not get options to register devices, so there's no keep alive. 
As we were discussing earlier, what happens is that generally speaking, you want to have first which have one internal profile uh, where your phones register to, such as my Brea phone, and you want to have an external profile such as 5080, that's where calls go out from, and that's where you receive calls from. Those will be named internal and external in the classic configuration structure. And there will each one of them has its own dial plan. This is a the bottom right comment is very, very important, and it's always something I want to make very clear. Almost any file name here, if you remember, frizzwitch.xml actually includes files uh, according to just its own syntax. So as long as you are including the correct files, they can have any name. The zip profiles themselves can be called anything, and the dial plan contacts can be called anything. Internal, external, public, default are just conventions that we do use in our own configurations. People generally adhere to those just because it's easier to get help if you're using a common nomenclature, but those, these co could all be named completely different. So there is no relationship between the fact that the dial plan is named public and the fact that it receives calls from outside. You could name it what literally whatever.xml and will still do the same thing as long as you're correctly referencing it from the external profile, which again, the external profile can, could be named outside and it will still work or whatever. Of course, the main caveat is don't name your configuration file according to your favorite actors or flavors of ice cream because that can, then gets uh, unwieldy very quickly. But you could do that. Speaking of which, not speaking of ice cream, but speaking of dial plans, we've uh, come to the interesting part here, which is the dial plan. So um, if you recall, we briefly went through how to set up a directory. So now I have a user. I associated the user to a domain. The domain in turn was associated to a zip profile, which made it possible for my user to register on the server through that internal zip profile. Now I have a phone that's capable of placing calls. Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, they might talk at some point. That's yeah, not a good idea. Well, not in Texas right now, but other places might talk. So the um, thing here is that uh, now I can place calls to the server. How do I make the call actually do something? Because at this point, I don't really know. That will be using the dial plan. A dial plan is defined as the series of actions that makes decisions of what to do with incoming and outgoing call. Uh, they, they're generally grouped through context. So you maybe have a set of extensions that are on the internal profile, so only registered phones can call them, and a set of ex a set of contexts that are set up on the external profiles. So that's where calls get handled from the outside. They can be very complex, but the main structure here is a... Um, so first of all, when you define a context, you define it in your dial plan folder and then go in... Uh, and then that's automatically included. Note that this example purposefully does things not wrong because this will work, but does things different than what you're used to seeing. As you can see here, we have a profile named example zip profile. This is a zip profile, as you can see in the file up there. But it's named the file is named zip example. The file names are arbitrary. The context is what acts as the link. While we've named we've purposefully named the dial plan file dial plan example, our convention will probably be to call this custom, right? Because the context defined inside it is custom, but why not? Let's call it dial plan example, just to highlight how what matters is the XML and not the file names, because again, files are just getting included. Nothing is reading the file names. The files are being read with their content. So here, we're associating a new profile we created with a new dial plan context we created. The default context has a lot in it. So let's go take a look at a few of them, making sure uh, we look at the simpler ones because there's really a lot in there. It's probably, I think it's the biggest file in the vanilla config. So it's uh, it's going to be interesting, but also quite complex. Got the editor to actually work this time. Great. Wow. Bam. I'll plan. I'm in the directory. Okay, here's the list of files. So I'm going to vim dial plan default.xml. 
boom, there's a lot in here. So well, let's skip the unloop stuff, which is just mm, helping with. Uh... This is an example of how to do a condition on a day. I'll make this even bigger because it's actually very interesting. So extensions are defined to a set of conditions and actions. So the name is generally not important. It's, the name is just a way to find out what the uh, uh, application, what the mm, to remember what the uh, extension is supposed to do. Uh, there's one or more conditions usually, and then there's an action. So here you can see a condition where we're going to set the variable to open equals true if it's a weekday between two and six, so not one, so not uh, not uh, Sunday or Saturday, and between nine and eighteen. So this is how you'd set a variable and then use it later. Let's go into actual extension examples so it's a bit easier. So intercepts are complicated. Um, what can we look here? Oh, <laughs> check this out. So uh, this is interesting. This is how first which warns you. Oh, it stopped updating it again, did it? I don't really know what that's the case. I mean, we're going to stay in here for a while, so might as well just share the actual application. Okay, so what I was saying earlier is that, as you can see here, first which uses the an extension to warn you. So if your default password is still one two three four, it logs a lot of critical warnings to let you know that you should you need to go change that immediately. This is a global extension. This call this gets called every time a call comes in. So what happens here is that effectively this will run every time you, you receive a call or even when it starts up. Detecting crypto, etc. That's a bit complicated. Uh, oh, so this is a bit easier. Okay. Mm, it's dropping destination number, call return, groups and ads. So this is all... Uh, Call group features. You can control call feature, call group features from your own, uh, from your own system. Bridging stuff, voicemail. Okay, let's look at this. So this is a simple one for change. As you can see here, this is probably the closest to the simplest extension we can build, which is a believable. Yeah, I think that's unfortunately that's my that's my computer having some problems today. I haven't been able to look at into into it yet, but we'll uh, we'll eventually figure it out. So okay, the updates that come back now. The uh, this is probably the group dial sales, and the following ones are probably the simplest extensions I can show you. These extensions have a um, just one condition, which is a destination number regular expression. So if you dial exactly two thousand. It will try to bridge you to the group call for the sales group. If you remember, we had some users set up in a group, so this will just dial the sales people effectively. Uh, this is the simplest you can have. Uh, expressions can be complex and be nested. Uh, there's a lot you can. Uh, there's a lot you can do here, but mostly the that's the the simplest thing is just going to be using the uh, reg apps and pointing them at things. Back to sharing my own screen, and I'll stay there until we're done because otherwise it gets too complicated. Yeah, I don't know why it's so slow, but it's nothing to do with the platform. It's it's my computer that's acting up. Oh wow! I decided to sh stop sharing now. Okay, we should be back in just a second. In the meantime. Okay, we're back. Okay, as we saw, uh, lock, local extension. So this is worth looking at, and let's do it in here. Uh, local extension is a huge extension that's purposefully built to do the most complicated thing possible. So this will be the extension users use to call each other. So if you remember, I registered as uh, uh, 1001, and there's extensions up to 1019, I think. So we purposefully use a complex reg X, but that uh, makes it so that if you dial a number that's going from 1000 to 1019, you will 
end up into this extension. We'll export the data extension as the as a variable to use it after, and then we'll bind meta apps. Meta apps are apps you can execute during a call if you press asterisk followed by the actual number. So asterisk two will start the recording in this case. We'll set the ring back, we'll set a transfer ring back, we'll set a call timeout, what to do when uh, I hang up. Um, okay, so continue, break, never. Uh, conti if an extension has continue on, um, as continue set to true, after it's done executing, it will continue down the dial plan and see if there's anything else matching. If you if an extension doesn't have continue true set up, it will uh, not continue and just end the execution. Normally, you want an extension to not continue uh, unless you're doing chained extensions where you're setting variables. So going back to this, there's a lot of more. We're inserting data into the call hash. We're, inserting, we're setting variables. There's a lot of, uh, uh, at some point, we finally get to bridging to the dial extension. So this is very complex. The bind meta app is probably the most interesting stuff. Others are just going to be set up just so you can show them. We'll answer and sleep. So if the call is still up after the call is answered, it will go into uh, voicemail. So effectively, this, uh, this setup will make it so that when a call is done, when a call is made and there is not answer, it will drop into voicemail. Mm, as you can see here, we'll, there's more of the explanations. And this is the bind meta app. So by, as I said, Asterisk 2 will set the record the call. Uh, you can transfer put calls into conference, etc. You can do, you can have the meta app do anything you want, which effectively allows you to do a very complicated in-call uh, features and controls. It's very, very useful. Uh, I'll skip through a few things here because we're, uh, well, you can set a ring back and a few other things. And then finally, you bridge out. If the call timeout lapses, so if the call timeout of 30 seconds lapses, it will bridge out to the voicemail. The public context is just a similar dial plan with less of uh, with, with less uh, stuff in it. The more important thing is being able to transfer to the private dial plan if you needed to. And what else? The public context is uses uh, to route incoming calls that are originated from outside the local network. They're treated to untrusted. So uh, if they don't, if they're not actually routed to an extension, they just hang up. So the public context actually does nothing else than check if you're able to get into another uh, context or not. Extensions are just definitions for calls. As we defined, we can have conditions. You can have nested conditions. By, def by default, a dial plan stops parsing when a match is found. And here's your answer. Uh, as the dial plan stops parsing when a match is found, and it uh, you can continue parsing the rest of the dial plan if it's desired. But generally speaking, what you want to do here is you want to um, you generally don't want to continue. But there's an example right here in the bottom right. So if continue set to true, it will keep evaluating. Conditions can be anything from variables to expressions to regular expressions. You can combine them with and and or. You can do a lot of different things there. I don't know what the problem is here. I'm trying, but uh, does you mean the video channel we're using? Yes, this is uh, web RTC, so it's encrypted. You can also do cryptography. Uh, Frisbee supports a very uh, complete, uh, a very well featured suite of uh, cryptography algorithms, etc. So you can do uh, SRTP, you can do secure RTP, you can do ZRTP, and there's a few others. Uh, so if you want any incoming call on a specific profile to go to a specific public dial plan, regardless of the destination number, you should use context. Yes, in fact, that's uh, the you will generally any call will end up in the public dial plan. Uh, you can have an if you have an extension that doesn't have a condition, it will always run. In that case, you certainly want to set the, con the extension to continue through without a condition. If you need to do anything, something for all calls to come in, you will have continue through and no condition. So originating is a way to make a call from Frisbee the destination, while bridge puts two channels together, which we saw in the dial plan. 
and transfer will not transfer the call, which is uh, this is something that some people have some difficulties wrapping their heads around. A uh, transfer will not actually transfer the call in the SIP sense of things. It will move the call to a different extension in the context. So it, it's effectively as if you just dial 1000 XML default in the second example here, it will be interpreted by the default context as 1000, which as you remember, will end up getting you talking to the 1000 registered user. Quick run through of modules. So uh, you can unload, reload modules. There's a lot of them. They're defined in the uh, they're defined in the show modules command, which will show you a lot of things. The main modules we want to look at are mod XML curl, which is very very interesting and important. So mod XML curl is how you serve your uh, configuration to through HTTP. So say you have multiple FreeSwitch servers and you want to have your configuration served uh, from a central place. And also if you want to make decisions during your configuration uh, service, you can use mod XML curl. You will define URLs that will be uh, either pulling a configuration file or a directory file or a dial plan file. If it's pulling a configuration file, you could be pulling the configuration for another module or something else, in which case the configuration will be called once a startup, while a directory endpoint will be invoked at every authentication request. So what you'll get is you get a, a, an HTTP request to your server saying, hey, Luca is trying to log in with the username Luca and password 1234. What do we do? And your application will then, I don't know, check the database, for example, and then return an XML that effectively be the same thing as the user stance that we saw earlier, or return a denied request, in which case I will not be able to log in. Uh, there's uh, no caching, but there's a retry, and you can do fallbacks. So you can define any number of fallbacks for the... Um, for the, the directory. And also, if the fallback fails, it, uh, the system will fall back to a local file. But depending on what how you're set up, the directory, for example, might not be very useful because generally speaking, you won't have users defined on a directory on a file on the server. So if your web server is down, you want to have a fallback, so multiple servers, so that you go down the list until you hit the final thing. While dial plan is useful to have a fallback to because you could have a simple dial plan on the machine that just plays something like, we're sorry, if something has gone wrong, please call back later. So directory is invoked at every authentication request. Dial plan is invoked at every call. So every time a call comes in, it's re-requested, which in this case, the request will say something like, hey, Luca has dialed 1234. What do we do? And your server could check with final authorized to enter the 1234 room and then return a stanza that's a conference which leads us to mod conference, uh, which I'll look at briefly because we're almost at time. But still, mod conference is the most powerful module in first which, in my opinion. It allows you to build any kind of video and audio conference, uh, including uh, any kind of configuration you can think of, codecs, quality, uh, having actions in the conference, kicking people, moderator controls. There's a lot. There could be an hour talk just in mod conference. So. Uh, take a look at the configuration, take a look at the samples. Uh, they're pretty well commented. And if there's any questions, in this case, I will ask you to um, ask me offline. I'll be happy to help. For example, you can do a lot of layouts. So you can do 3x3, 4x4, 5x5, or really you can define anything. So mod conference is what's powering what you're looking at. So the uh, system, uh, GPU processing is already is already set up, and the API for conference is a just mod conference. So the conference list, uh, the conference set of commands has a comprehensive ways to list people, list conferences, kick people, etc. Uh, make config changes. Uh, uh, API JSON mod curl. Uh, no, this require mod XML curl requires XML. Very, very quickly, mod signal wire is a way to connect signal wire trunks to first switch installations. Uh, this is not an obligatory pitch. It's actually quite useful. So I want you to take a look at this. Uh, just it's It comes installed with any vanilla installation. And all you need to do is get a token from your signal wire from the common line, which I'll try doing one last time just for the sake of old times, if it actually works. Oh. It likes me and it likes me now. Great. So signal wire token. It's all you need to do. At your connection token setup, you get your connection token, go to signal wire, register for an account, which is something I suggest doing if you haven't done it yet. Enter your token and 
just hit connect and you instantly have calls coming in to your signal wire uh to your first server and you can also dial out using the signal wire gateway there is literally nothing else to do it's uh, of course if you need to reset the data you can unload the module etc but it's super simple and super useful and it really almost takes nothing to do just take token go to your dashboard hit connect and you're done already then you hit Sophia status and you'll see signal wire registered as we saw earlier so uh, there's a lot of next generation services coming and I hope you'll join us in this journey. But for now, thank you for attending and I hope you like my presentation. Uh, there's a lot to do in Freswitch. There could be hours and hours and hours. It could be an eight hour webinar. There will still be more to do, but I hope this is a good start for people who want to get started playing with Freswitch and telephony. Anything you need, let me know. We'll be here to help. And thank you for attending. Click on TGI 2021. It's been a pleasure being with you. Goodness me, you fitted a lot in there, Luca. A huge amount into that uh, small amount of time. And uh, Ryan's asking when the eight-hour webinar is going to be. <laughs> stay, stay tuned, uh, Ryan. Uh, and, and by the way, Ryan, if you're not already in the community Slack, in fact, I know you are in the community Slack because you sent me a message, so forget that. If anybody else is not in the community Slack, then do join in at uh, the free switch and signal wire community slack channels we've got lots of exciting information in there regular community activity on a friday morning at 10 a.m central with the clue con can cafe regular um, interviews with people in the community um, on the clue con weekly as well and um, jack from nokia is saying that he'd like to hear about nat at some other time and I'm sure that can be arranged at some time. For sure. Please. So my my email, I usually have my email up in the uh, I usually have my email up in the um, in the presentation. It's not here for some reason, but it's everybody knows it. So just email me at Luke at signalwire.com if you have questions that pop after after a call, or if there's something I'd like to do offline, I'll be happy to either help you or steer you towards the right people. Or there's a the community Slack. Very much. Very, so. much. Very much. Okay. Um, now we've come to the end of the formal part of ClueCon TGI 2021. We've had some great sessions over the last couple of days, haven't we, Abby? Oh, yes. That was so much fun. Um, it really, uh, I don't know about all of you, but I'm in the freezing cold. So this uh, really warmed my heart. Aw, was that too cheesy? <laughs> no, this was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of family and community warmth. And it goes by so quickly doesn't it? We've had two full days and they've zoomed past. Oh, excuse the zoom word, but they've just happened oh, so quickly, yeah. haven't they? <laughs> yes, but not to not to worry if you're sad like we are that ClueCon is over. We will be back in August. Um, of course, like David said, we're in here every Friday just hanging out, chit-chatting, talking about free switch, talking about signal wire, talking about you know, just catching up also, um, keeping up with the community, hearing about all the things you're working on. But if we want an official ClueCon, uh, mark your calendars for August because we will be back at it. Hopefully, we can all meet up in Chicago, fingers crossed. But make sure to follow us on Facebook and on Twitter uh, to get all the latest updates and the latest happenings, as well as check in on our ClueCon website. Uh, we'll always have updates there. But no matter what, we'll be here in August, whether it's virtual or in person. So I'm really looking forward to that. For sure. And now, don't forget to sign up for the coder games. It's going to be a lot of fun. And Abby, the prize gal, I see I've been mm -hmm. down in the chat, has lots more <laughs> prizes to give away. So make sure you sign up for the coder games. The first uh, thing that people get from the coder games is they get the kit mailed to them, don't they? And that's got an Arduino board and various yeah. other goodies that's inside it. Prize. Really, that's cool. Like you get an Arduino board just uh, just to play some games with us. Pretty good deal. <laughs> it is very cool. Now, Abby, I don't want to let the occasion slip by without saying a very, very big thank you to all of our speakers, uh, all of our workshop leaders, all of our sponsors. We're very, very grateful to everybody that contributes. There's, there's a, uh, a little round of applause from Sharon there. And I can honestly say that if you have enjoyed it, half as much as we have, then we've enjoyed it twice as much as you. Because that's basic mathematics. <laughs> right uh, I'm going to uh, let Abby tell you about what's coming next, because although the formal program is over, there's still a little bit more fun to be had.
Oh, yeah. So those of you who have been to ClueCon before already know, but for those of us who are new, uh, we're never done. We're, we just are always, always going on with the fun. We always like to hang out. So we're all going to head over to the lounge right now just to chit chat and hang out. Danny over here has challenged me to a rematch in Quiplash. So if anybody's interested in that, um, but we're also going to be giving a toast. Thank you to all of the wonderful people behind the scenes who made this conference mm. so successful. It was so great to see so many new faces and see some old friends as well. And uh, let's go hang out, grab a drink, even if it's just some coffee, get a snack, and let's all go catch up in the lounge. I'm prepared for the toast in the lounge. We'll see you all there. Yeah, let's toast. <laughs> Okay, let's go. Well, we can't toast in here. It's the rules. <laughs> Stop toasting, you guys. You've got to save it for the other room. <laughs> okay. You can find the oh, yeah. lounge. Oh, yeah. Ah, okay, let's see. One of the magic uh, magic yeah, powers that come up as a power lady is that I can just take...